This week on Christian World News, the Sistine Chapel in a way you've never seen before. A new exhibit gives a unique view of Michelangelo's masterpiece. We'll take an up-close look at the larger-than-life images that people are calling awe-inspiring. Plus, scandals in the church as prominent Christian leaders suffer public falls from grace. What can be done to restore confidence in church leadership? And from American Idol to the Dove Awards, singer Tasha Layton shares her story and why she's grateful to be where she is today. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, imagine being able to enjoy the beauty and wonder of the Sistine Chapel right in your own city. From Australia to Mexico to Shanghai to New York, people in more than 60 cities across the globe can do just that. A traveling exhibit is giving visitors a unique look at Michelangelo's vision of the creation. CBN's Gabe LaMonica has the story. When Michelangelo brought the Bible to life some 500 years ago, it's hard to imagine he thought his masterpiece on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel would ever make its way from the Vatican to a shopping mall in Richmond, Virginia. But here we are, the agony and the ecstasy. In 1965, Charlton Heston's portrayal of a 33-year-old Michelangelo Bonarotti transported the Sistine Chapel to the silver screen. I wanted to paint that as it was first created. Now, a roving global exhibit is bringing visitors face-to-face -face with the Italian artist's visualization of the book of Genesis. It's almost as if we're looking at God creating the world, the beginning of Genesis, and we're seeing the the cornucopia, the, the richness of God's creation unfolding in front of us. From Adam's creation. It gives me the chills. It truly gave me anxiety to see how close but not quite touching their fingers were. Showing that tangible space between man and God to the downfall. A pained look banished from paradise. Soon, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, the exhibition, will hit 80 cities, bringing to life nine scenes from the Bible. Tiffany, I feel like you are living proof that you don't need to know anything about Michelangelo or the Sistine Chapel to appreciate his paintings. Absolutely. Which is your favorite? So my favorite one is over here in the Ancestors of Christ room. There's a guy in the back that's uh, back here you won't be able to see that 60 feet up in Italy. No need for a deep background in art history to appreciate this masterpiece. Many of them say that they were, weren't able to see the ceiling clearly because it was so high up, or they didn't have enough time to really look at the ceilings. The cracked fresco shown in vivid relief, even revealing the great flood. Which no one built at the instruction from God. A level of access to the world famous paintings that even connoisseurs can appreciate. You've been once and you haven't ever forgotten it, and it astonished you when you saw it. I think I've been 55 times in my life, and it never fails to astonish me every time I go in. Professor William Wallace has written eight books on the sculptor turned painter. Michelangelo is an artist who goes from zero to 60 in less than a second. He just is capable of undertaking monumental tasks and carrying them out so that suddenly the artist who's never made, painted a fresco paints the most important fresco in the world. Some of the brass tacks, the vault is nearly seven stories high with some 5,000 square feet of painting. And even on a curved ceiling, Michelangelo achieves a three-dimensional effect. The technical challenges are, uh, are astronomical and it's just amazing how well he solved all of them. The first being, you know, how do you get a scaffold up there? But then how do you paint 14 foot seated figures that are 14 feet high that are on that curve and yet make them look like they're just properly proportioned and seated, not in some kind of mirror like thing. Yeah, yeah, like not, it's like it could have been like, it could have looked like a house a of mirrors. mirror. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. House of horrors. Instead of horror, the awe of God. What you have painted there, my son, is not a portrait of God. It's a proof of faith. Whether you're religious or not, this image of God creating man is the ultimate symbol of the creation story. 
That's the legacy Michelangelo left when he created one of the most famous works of art in the world. Gabe LaMonica, CBN News, Richmond, Virginia. Gabe, fascinating. Well, coming up, recent scandals involving Christian leaders have rocked the church. One pastor has encouraging words on restoring confidence among the faithful. Stay with me. Welcome back. A new study points to the benefits of faith in the lives of young people. Josh Packard of the Springtide Research Institute has done extensive study into 13 to 25 year olds. His finding, religion is good for you. He tells CBN's Faithwire, those who pray and have a connection with God are more likely to flourish in their happiness and mental health. According to his study, 73% of religious young people believe their spiritual practices have a positive impact on their outlook. No doubt. Well, research shows confidence in Christian leaders has been declining in recent years, sparked in, in part by reports of abuse, immorality, and other scandals. Charlene Aaron shares how one pastor sees the need for a new generation of leaders following the requirements laid out in Scripture. Jesus has words for us about leadership, as does Paul, as does Peter, as does the epistle to Hebrews. So the New Testament, and going back to the Old Testament as well, God has not left us without a vision for what leadership should look like in the local church. In his new book, Workers for Your Joy, The Call of Christ on Christian Leaders, pastor and seminary professor David Mathis emphasizes how that call must be viewed through the lens of Scripture, the embracing a priority of servitude. It comes from the Apostle Paul at the end of his first chapter in his second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, we don't lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. And if Paul, who is an apostle and one of the official spokesmen for the risen Christ who wrote scripture, could say that he didn't lord over his leadership over the Corinthians, but he worked with them for their joy, how much more so pastors in the local church that we would have a vision that why we are leading is for the sake of the joy of our people in Jesus Christ. On CBN's Prayer Link, Mathis says his book specifically follows the recent rise and fall of various church leaders and points out what possibly led them astray. You will find in one rise and fall story after another, some clear brooch mm -hmm. of uh, attribute and virtue that has been laid out by Christ and his apostles two millennia ago in the New Testament. So that list in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1 is significant. Paul means it. The apostles mean it. And there is wisdom in that list for healthy, normal leaders in the church today. The qualifications in the 1 Timothy list includes being blameless, sober, and of good behavior. Mathis adds the ability to teach is also key. When we think of ability, we might think of, oh, does this mean world-class oratory or great gifting? You know, is he an entertainer? Is he a gifted communicator? I don't think that's what's meant. What's meant is ability in the context, and it's a man who wants to teach. The pastors and elders should be those who want to feed the flock, like Jesus said, to feed his sheep, and to do that through teaching the Bible. It can be very simple, simple. A simplicity, Mathis says, is needed now more than ever. Christianity is a teaching movement. Jesus was the consummate teacher in a day, frankly, where people can bristle at teaching. Oh, they want pastors to do just about anything other than teach. Do this, do that, care for us, listen to us, counsel us, very important things. But sometimes there is a kind of pressure in the pastoral ministry to not teach. And that is the central qualification and calling of local church pastors in the New Testament. While Mathis challenges aspiring and seasoned leaders to faithfully embrace the call of Christ, he also encourages those in their congregations to consistently pray for them. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Up next, the artist behind the song, Look What You've Done, shares what God has done in her own life. Tasha Layton tells what brought her back to the church at a time when she was contemplating suicide. Welcome back to Christian World News. Singer and songwriter Tasha Layton is known for her smash hit, Look What You've Done. The song reached the Billboard charts and made her one of the top five female Christian artists in 2022. It was also nominated for Song of the Year at this year's Dove Awards. 
Ephraim Graham sat down with Tasha at her home in Nashville to talk about her life and her music. what you've done so we sit here on the eve of the dove awards a year ago you were doing pre-show yeah this year nominated how's it feeling it feels great you know i i think my personality is one i love to see growth and mm. progression and i think it's just a natural progression of you know how things are going and the music connecting to people and so I'm so excited. The fact that I'm I'm doing this now, it's really, really sweet. Beautiful. And I think the timing of it is beautiful because I thought, you know, so many things in my life that I thought were detours mm -hmm. were certainly not. Look what you've done in me. You spoke your truth into the lies I let my heart believe. How special is the nomination for specifically the song of the year? What's that like for you? You know, the amount of people who write in and tell me that this song is their anthem, mm. that it's gotten them through hard times, that it has given them courage and boldness and faith to face the future. And um, it's just, I think it really is a testament to how this song has touched so many people. That's totally God. I feel you healing all my wounds up. So you write this song with a team. Tell me about the process. What was the prayer? What were you guys trying to say? This song is my testimony in mm -hmm. a song. And so when I walked into the writing session that day, mm -hmm. I said, I want to write a song about what God has done in my life. And sometimes when we write the most personal songs, mm -hmm. they end up being the most universal. And mm -hmm. so I think that was the case for this song. It was very, very personal to me. And it ended up being something that a lot of people really caught on to. Amazed at what God is doing with it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You were saying that you felt looking back, you thought some parts of your life were detours. What would you say you thought was a detour? Is it touring with Katy Perry? Is it American Idol? What did you think were detours? Yeah, most definitely American Idol. Mm. I wasn't sure why I was doing that show. But I think looking back, I can see how God used that show to sort of, me, sort of give me an idea of how I could be ministering outside of the, the church. And mm. so I think a lot of times uh, when I would think of, you know, that show and, you know, what all happened on the show, I'm like, why in the world am I here? <laughs> what am I doing? I said I would never do a show like that. And then uh, here we were. And when I left the show, I thought, you know, I think I'm supposed to be doing music outside of the church. And I told my pastor and he said, you know, we've known that for years, Tasha. We've just been trying, you know, waiting for you to figure it out. Wow. And so when, uh, when I ended up getting the job with Katie, it was, it felt like a detour and it didn't. Mm. And so I kind of think, you know, my time with her at different seasons felt like, what are you doing? And then at other seasons, it felt like, gosh, I'm right in the middle of what you've called me to do right now, God. Mm -hmm. And so I think we all kind of walk through that, don't we? Where, mm -hmm. you know, when we feel a grace to do something, there are times when we feel really comfortable in it and gung-ho. <laughs> and then there are times where we're questioning, what am I doing with my life? And so I think I experienced all of those emotions with mm -hmm. Katie. And looking back, I thought they were detours and they really weren't. It was beautiful. And that's what I say about God's timing. His timing is so perfect. Can you make something from the wreckage? Would you take this heart and make it whole again? You shared um, dark times in your life mm -hmm. where you were actually contemplating suicide. Yeah. What happened? I had been really wounded in the church mm -hmm. and I couldn't reconcile how Christians could be so mean <laughs> with wow. what I read in scripture. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the tools to process what was going on in my life. And so I went searching. And at the end of that road of searching, I found myself to be more depressed, more isolated than I ever had felt before. And I tried to take my life. Mm -hmm. And it was at that lowest of low though, that I realized, Jesus was the only one out of all those things I searched out 
that had any power to transform or any power to give me true peace. And so I forced myself to go back to church. I thought, you know what? At some point, it's got to stick. One Sunday, the pastor said, if you want a touch from God, come up at the end of service and we want to pray for you. And I left three hours later. And I always make this joke that they would have had to replace the square of carpet on the altar where I was because mm. of all of my snot. I just <laughs> <laughs> completely, I, it was an altar moment for me and it changed the trajectory of my life. And I just knew, you know, I had a lot of healing left to go, mm -hmm. but I knew that the Lord had done something in my heart that day that was really, really special. And it hasn't been the same since. I think there are many nights that I sing, look what you've done, and I might not get through it because mm -hmm. I get emotional remembering what God has done in my own life. And mm -hmm. so um, even last night, I got off stage and I went to the bathroom and I cried for like 20 minutes mm -hmm. just out of gratefulness, um, just gratefulness for the fact that I'm here, mm -hmm. the fact that I have a beautiful family, I'm getting to do what I prayed to get to do when I was a young girl. And seeing people's lives changed yeah. every night, can't trade that for anything. Mm. I mean, that, that gets me up in the morning. I'm singing, look what you've done. Well, Tasha Layton's hit song, Look What You've Done, is available online wherever music is sold. We'll be right back after this. CBN News app, 24-7 news from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Israeli archaeologists have found an ancient comb dating back some 3,700 years. It bears what is likely the oldest known full sentence in the Canaanite alphabet. The comb was found in 2016 at a dig in southern Israel, but it was late last year when a professor at Hebrew University noticed the tiny inscription. It contains 17 letters that read, may this tusk May this tusk root out the lice of the hair and the beard. Archaeologists also say they have found microscopic evidence of head lice on that comb. The discovery shines new light on some of the earliest use of the Canaanite alphabet, which was invented around 1800 B.C. And by the way, is the foundation of all subsequent alphabetic systems, including Hebrew, Arabic, Greek and Latin. Strange about the lice, though. Well, the whole word for the whole world, that's the goal of a movement to translate the Old Testament into languages worldwide. Currently, 90% of the world's languages do not have a translation of the Old Testament. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem on the effort to eliminate the original Testament gap. On Pentecost this year, these men and women gathered at the garden tomb to work on expanding the use of the Old or original testament worldwide. Original testament gap refers to the fact that the original testament is under translated, underused, and frequently misunderstood. We therefore commit to do all that we can to accelerate the translation of the original testaments into every living language in order to help fulfill the Great Commission. That resulted in signing the Jerusalem Declaration to eliminate the original Testament gap. Well, that's what this consultation is, is about. We have people from around the, the globe that have gathered here very prayerfully to seek the Lord, saying, Lord, we're now aware that there is this very significant gap. Would you show us what we're to do and how you would have see this eliminated, this gap eliminated. YWAM's David Hamilton explains why they chose to use the term original testament. Because when something's old, you just want to toss it out and replace it with something else. Original speaks of a foundation that has legacy and value in a multi-generational way. The original testament was the Bible that Jesus and the apostles used and we want everyone to have access to it. The New Testament is most comprehensible when it's really connected 
to the original Testament. They point out that this is needed to fully understand the New Testament. The original Testament is the foundation for us to understand the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus came preaching. Can you imagine reading the New Testament and you come across mention of David or Abraham or Moses or Rahab or Gideon or any of the other heroes of our faith or places like Bethel or Jericho or Jerusalem and events like crossing the Red Sea or manna in the desert and you have no idea in your language what those stories were about. What happened? Who were these people? To illustrate their point, they published the Gap Testament, a version of the New Testament without any references to the original Testament. So when there's a direct quotation, the, the text is whited out. When there's an intentional illusion, it's toned down to watermark level. And so this is what it looks like in Acts 7, when Stephen is talking and giving his sermon that gets him killed. And all but two verses are direct quotations out of the original Testament. And you can see as you go through the scriptures, different parts are just missing because when we read it, the New Testament, without an understanding of the original, we do not get the full picture of God's purposes. So we just want the fullness of God's good word to be available to all people. The goal is the whole word for the whole world. Now comes the strategy, tools and help they need to accomplish this huge goal. Oh, first we're gonna ask the Lord that his spirit will stir people in their hearts and that they will want to participate and understand how important it is to understand that the only scripture that Jesus' disciples and Paul had was the original testament. And they're asking for the body of Christ to join them. If you have this burden to eliminate that gap, we would invite you to start praying for it. Pray for all the languages in the world. 90% of the languages do not have the original testament. Start praying for those languages. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Amen. Start praying for those languages. The whole word for the whole world. Great idea. Well, thanks for joining us this week. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you.